Well, good morning. Um, I am excited to be with you this morning and share with you the word. We are going to jump right in. Um, I want to share with you some things that uh, really just been burning in me from the Lord over the last few weeks. And we're going to start in Daniel 3. And we're going to spend a lot of time actually in the Word this morning, Um, so I would just encourage you to get your Bible. If you don't have it already, grab it. Um, I've been watching the Westgate Kids uh, videos for our kids, and they always say, go get your Bible, and then they have a fun countdown video, and the kids race around and get their Bibles and their pencils. So I don't have a cool countdown video, uh, but I do want to encourage you to go get your Bible. Go get your Bible. If you don't have one with you right now, then grab your phone, because I want you to follow along with me. What I'm going to read this morning in Daniel 3 is a very familiar story to a lot of us, but... um, I feel like there is a timely word in here for us, and so I pray that we can hear it with fresh ears this morning, and if you would even, I mean, I don't know if you do this, but I sure do, I underline when something, when God's speaking something fresh to me in the word, I underline it, and I would just encourage you to do the same this morning as I read um, when the Holy Spirit prompts something in your heart, you want to connect to it, underline it, circle it. Uh, So you can go back to it and process it more. Daniel 3, we're going to read verses 1 through 18. King Nebuchadnezzar made a gold statue 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then he sent messages to the high officers, officials, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the provincial officials to come to the dedication of the statue he had set up. So all these officials came and stood before the statue King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald shouted out, people of all races and nations and languages, listen to the king's command. When you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and other musical instruments, bow to the ground to worship King Nebuchadnezzar's gold statue. Anyone who refuses to obey will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. So at the sound of the musical instruments, all the people, whatever their race or nation or language, bowed to the ground and worshiped the gold statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. But some of the astrologers went to the king and informed on the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, Long live the king. You issued a decree requiring all the people to bow down and worship the gold statue when they hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and other musical instruments. That decree also states that those who refuse to obey must be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, whom you have put in charge of this province of Babylon. So they had authority and position, authority, position in Babylon already. They refused to bow down. They paid no attention to you, your majesty. They refused to serve your gods and do not worship the gold statue you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar flew into a rage and ordered that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought before him. If you have a pencil, would you just underline or circle, flew into a rage. When they were brought in, Nebuchadnezzar said to them, is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you refuse to serve my gods or to worship the gold statue I've set up? I will give you one more chance to bow down and worship the statue I have made when you hear the sound of the musical instruments. But if you refuse, you will be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. And then what God will be able to rescue you from my power? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, 
underline that, even if he doesn't. We want to make it very clear to you that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you have set up. Nebuchadnezzar, in a fury and rage, then threw them into the furnace. And most of us know the rest of the story, but I'm not even going to tell the rest of the story today because what I want us to sit with is the passion, commitment, and conviction of these three Hebrew boys who said, I know our God is powerful and able to save us, but even if he doesn't, we will not bow. Let's just pray together. Lord, I ask now for your anointing on the word. Holy Spirit, help. Holy Spirit, help me to articulate what I've heard you speak clearly and effectively. And God, would it go from my mouth to hearts and speak with as many different people as are listening. The only way your Holy Spirit can make the message penetrate exactly what needs to be said to each one. Holy Spirit, do it. Angels, I ask you, Lord, Lord, send the angels, commission the angels to go and do the work of ministry of the word of God this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. History is moving towards one unchangeable goal, the everlasting kingdom of God. All of history is moving towards one unchangeable, unmovable goal. People may know it, they may not know it. Kings and kingdoms may recognize it or not recognize it, but they are heading towards one unmovable, unchangeable goal, and that is the everlasting kingdom of God. Jesus is on a rescue mission. The one seated on the throne, Revelation 21.5 says, Jesus himself said, look, I am making everything new. We are in the middle of a story, friends, of God who is making everything new. And we are on this trajectory of history towards a moment, Revelation 21 describes it, this moment in time where Jesus descends, he brings a new heaven and a new earth, and he says, here it is, it's done. The kingdom is now fully established. But we live in this tension that some theologians call the already and the not yet. Because we do live in a measure of the kingdom of God. When Jesus came, he said the kingdom is near, the kingdom is here, and he gave us authority, and he gave us a role to play in establishing this kingdom. But then there's also this part of not yet, where we don't always see it in fullness yet. We still live in a broken, fallen world, and we live under the consequences of that sin. And so there's this already tension of we know this kingdom we're a part of, and then this not yet where we are not quite where we know we are headed. And isn't this kind of where Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego found themselves as well? I know my God is powerful. I know my God is able. I know he will rescue me, but even if he doesn't. Even if he doesn't, I have a hope in the not yet that's bigger than the already. Satan is angry. He wants to devour you. He wants to devour all of humanity. He sees where we're headed. He knows the end is coming. Revelation 12 verse 9 says, This great dragon... The ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, the one deceiving the whole world, was thrown down to the earth with all his angels. Verse, in verse 12, it says, terror will cover the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you in great anger, knowing that he has little time. Verse 17 says, the dragon was angry at the woman and declared war against the rest of her children. That represents the people of God. This dragon hates us, friends. We're in a war. 
because we're heading towards a kingdom and a victory and the enemy knows it and he knows his time is short and like Nebuchadnezzar, his face is distorted with fury. He is angry, verse 17 says, at all who keep God's commands and maintain in the face of the not yet, in the face when the even if he doesn't, we will maintain the testimony of Jesus. However, I think that we have missed, mostly as the American church, first world church, we have missed what it means to join with Jesus in this rescue mission. We have completely missed the point of what it means to be advancing the kingdom of God. We've created our own narrative. We think that the lost world around us is going to be drawn to Jesus by our likability. So we've put all of our efforts into being nice enough, cool enough, smart enough. Maybe if I can show and prove that I have reasoned through everything well enough, the world will finally be convinced that I'm smart too. Maybe if I'm happy enough, successful enough, the world will finally see that Jesus would be good for their life too. As if Jesus is a genie in a bottle that we just rub when we have a problem and he pops up and solves our problem and then we move on with our life. As if he isn't the king of kings and lord of lords that rules and reigns and is coming soon. You see, the problem with our version of advancing the kingdom is, number one, it's not effective. And number two, and most importantly, it's not what Jesus said his kingdom is about. Listen to his words. What blessings await you when people hate you and exclude you and mock you and curse you as evil? because you follow the Son of Man. When that happens, Jesus says, be happy. Leap for joy. Because why? Because there's a not yet coming. Because Jesus says there's a great reward that awaits you in heaven. And remember that your ancestors treated the ancient prophets the same way. Friends, I know some of you are going to argue, oh no, now you're giving people permission to be rude and hateful and call themselves Christians. Guys, that's such an extreme far reach on this. The fact of the matter is, when you refuse to bow to the idols of this culture, when you stick your finger in Satan's face and say, I will not bow, even if I'm crushed by this world, like Job said, even if he slays me, yet will I serve him. When you live your life that way, it would seem that everyone would stand up and cheer, but they won't. They'll mock you. They'll even call the good that you do evil. It doesn't, it does, I'm, nobody ever says that Christians should be evil and we should be okay with it. That's not what this is saying. Jesus says, when you're following me, when you're living with the fruit of the Spirit, there will be people that will hate you for it. There will be people that will mock you for it. There will be people that will call what you're doing evil. And you should rejoice because that's what it means to be advancing the kingdom of God. We've got it so messed up. But Jesus says, our version of success is actually sorrowful. What sorrow awaits you who are rich? For you have your only happiness now. What sorrow awaits you who are fat and prosperous now? For a time of awful hunger awaits you. What sorrow awaits you who laugh now? For your laughing will turn to mourning and sorrow. What sorrow awaits you who are praised by the crowds, for their ancestors also praised false prophets. Guys, that's our version of Christianity. 
It's so pervasive. I, it's like the, the fish in the bowl with the water. We don't even know what we're surrounded by. It's so much a part of who we are. It's so much a part of what's feeding us and telling us the value systems that we should live even as believers. That if I can be successful and look successful and be happy and have a good group of friends and show the world that it's as much fun to be a Christian as not a Christian, then somehow that's going to pull in the herd. That's going to heart bring in the harvest. And it's not. It's not effective. Look what it's done. It's done zero for effectivity. We are losing the generations because we've picked up a model that Jesus himself says will only produce sorrow for you. So what do we do? How are we going to go from this lame version of following Jesus that's ineffective and quite frankly, will lead us only to judgment. And we'll look more at those scriptures in a minute. But there's a judgment for the way that we are currently living our Christian life. So how do we transfer what we've known in our own version of following Jesus to a biblical version, an overcoming version of following Jesus? A version that says, I'm committed to the ultimate fulfillment of the kingdom of God. If it means that in this not yet moment, I might suffer. And in this not yet moment, it might not all work out for me. If in this not yet moment, maybe my healing won't come. I know he's a healer. I know he heals. But even if he doesn't, I will serve him. So here's how we overcome. Even if you look at the life of these three Hebrew princes, you can see, and and take time this week even to look. I don't have time to unpack it all, but look at Daniel 1 and Daniel 2, and you'll see how all along the way, they were given opportunities to bow. And in the small ways, they stood strong, and they said, we won't defile ourselves. This isn't our home. This isn't my home. I won't defile myself. This isn't my home. So then when they're faced with Satan himself, saying see that furnace you're going in the furnace and no god will save you they said even if he doesn't we will go in that fire the first thing we learn from them is that you don't bow you never bow and before you get to the point where you are facing a fiery furnace there's a lot of things along the way that we have choices of bowing to I want to press this hard on us this morning. We will only bow to the one true king. Every idol must come down. Friends, I see this morning this picture of idols in our homes as decorations. And we've treated them like they don't matter because they're just adding to the aesthetic of our life. I'm not lifting my hands or praying to it. Surely it's okay. And God says, every idol must come down. No more can they live in our sphere. No more can they be a part of our homes. No more can they influence our lives or be the atmosphere of our lives. Every idol must come down. You see, what idols represent is a false security. We go to idols as our protection, because they offer provision and ultimately bring us a sense of power that we have control, which actually N.T. Wright says the ultimate sin, really, if you take sin down to its very root, it's idolatry. It's a worship problem. It's a worship of self. It puts me in the throne of my life. And guys, we live in a land and culture that has idols that are set up to be worshipped. They may not look like Nebuchadnezzar. They may not have physical representations, but they are very much a reality. And we are tempted every day because everyone around us Just like in Babylon, every nation, every tribe, everyone in leadership, everyone in authority, everyone's bowing to this idol. We could look around us and go, you know what? I think God will understand because 
Think about it, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they've been given this place of authority. They, because of Daniel interpreting dreams in chapter two, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego have authority over all of Babylon. So can you imagine, in our value system, in an American value system, we would say, we would justify bowing because we would say, God, look at this position you've given me. If I don't bow in this moment, I'll lose the influence that you want me to have for your sake. But we can't bow. Guys, the idols of our culture, of this Northwest region, are the pleasures of life and comfort and ease. And I know some of you, I can hear it. Like, you've talked about this before, Vanessa. Why do you harp on these idols? Because God harps on idols. It's all through the Bible. It must be so important to him. These are not just empty statues. They represent something of who we are and who God is and where our worship goes. And God will not relent on the idol problem. Hebrews 11.25 tells of Moses, who is in Egypt, again, like Shadrach and Meshach, he's in the heights of power in Pharaoh's palace. And he's sitting there, and he has all the pleasures of life. And Hebrews says, but he chose instead to share the oppression of God's people instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin. He thought it was better to suffer for the sake of Christ than to own the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking ahead to his great reward. There's a not yet that we must value more than the pleasures of this life. God, if, if there's anything that we um, need to recognize in this season and maybe God's pointing out to us and giving a moment to, is how much we are spoiled, entitled brats. The fact that this quarantine has us, and I'm not diminishing that some truly are suffering, but for the most part, we're living in heated homes with a roof over our head, our grocery stores are open, our medical communities are working hard and available to us. We have internet, we have Instacart, we have Amazon Prime. What is our problem? I'm so sick of people talking about how hard this is. This is nothing. This is nothing. We are so entitled because we worship the pleasures of life. We're suddenly finding ourselves stripped of maybe one or two pleasures and we don't know what to do with ourselves because our lives are built around idols. Christians, I'm talking to us. I'm talking to me. Our lives are built around the pleasures of life and the pleasures of ease. We think God is here to make our life easy. We think the kingdom coming, we pray for revival so our churches will be filled and it'll feel better. Our culture will be less oppressive to us. The idols of this land are fear and control. You see it especially right now. If you don't bow to the idol of fear right now, you will be singled out, you will be mocked, You will be made to feel stupid. And I don't mean anybody should be foolish and do dumb things. No one's saying that. But here's what I won't do. I won't bow to your idol of fear. I won't bow to it. We cannot bow to the idol of fear. The problem is we love our life too much. We love this life too much. We're so afraid to let go. We have a hard grip on our life. Because we've created here a heaven on earth. If you compare our life, especially in this northwest region, if you compare our life to most of civilization at this point, we are rich. The poorest of us is rich compared to the rest of the world. We have so much that we've created ourselves little heavens. What could God possibly create for me in heaven that I haven't already created for myself? So I don't ache for eternity. I don't yearn for eternity because I love my life right now too much. 
I've created nice experiences for my family. I like to travel. I do beautiful things. We have memories. This is a wonderful world. Let's stay right here. We have missed out on the big picture of God's advancement of his kingdom leading to Revelation 21 where he comes and says, I've made everything new. And yes, we're supposed to be praying for his kingdom come and his will be done. But listen to this. Listen to how we overcome in this world. Revelation 12, 11. We know this. We know this well, at least the first part. And it's quoted often. They overcome or they defeat Satan by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. We love those. We love those. But here's what we don't say. And they did not love their lives so much that they were afraid to die. I don't know about you, but that wrecks me because I don't find myself measuring up to those who did not love their lives so much that they were afraid to die. And that's the third piece of overcoming that we miss. We have completely missed. And I think we are in danger. We are in danger, as wealthy as all of us are, the lifestyle that we live, we are in danger of missing out on kingdom advancement of we'll get to heaven someday and see how much we missed out on because we bought into a false narrative of what this is all about. We have to fix our eyes on Jesus. Listen, some of you have a wrong view of Jesus. There's so much talk about how loving and full of grace he is and we have defined him in our own we've given an, our own definition to who Jesus is and even what grace is and what love is that we don't deal with our stuff and we think he's okay with it and we think he understands we think he understands our sin we think he makes room for it there are some of you that are every day making excuses for your life of sin because you've created a Jesus in your own image. Yes. But you need to fix your eyes on the true Jesus. Yeah. The Jesus who went to the cross and died for the very things that you're entertaining yourself by. It's easy for us to look at the industry of sex slavery and, and be so appalled that that kind of evil could happen. And yet in our living rooms, we're watching shows and entertainment and giving our attention to the things that fuel that industry. It's time for us to see Jesus as who he is. He is a fierce warrior and he is coming on a rescue mission. And some of us, instead of partnering with his rescue, are sitting in a trap ourselves and loving it. We have air-conditioned prisons that we've made ourselves that we feel great about because they are decorations. We make our chains look fancy and nice and tell everybody that it's our trauma or our need for therapy and we'll be working on this later. But Jesus says, get free and join me in this mission. He is fierce about sin. He went to the cross for it. Get your eyes on Jesus. And when your eyes are set on Jesus, when your yes is set on who you will bow to, then your no's can be strong. You know, Hebrews talks about the cloud of witnesses that surrounds us. It says, because of all these, this is our inheritance, this is our heritage. When we come into the body of Christ, we're now grafted into this new family, this new DNA runs through our veins. And it's part of this people that it, they went under such suffering and they held on in faith and they never saw the promise. And that's who's surrounding us. And they're cheering us on. And they're saying, strip off every weight that slows you down. Get rid of every sin that easily trips you up because it's worth it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Let us run with endurance the race God has set before this. And here's how we do this. By keeping our eyes on Jesus. 
the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because listen, here's how he endured. The joy awaiting him, because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. And now he's seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Verse three, think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people, and then you won't give up. Then you won't get weary. After all, you have not given your lives in your struggle against sin. What? You have not given your life in your struggle against sin. I picked up, I picked up a book a couple weeks ago. Fox's Book of Martyrs, which is a classic. They've added to it. They continue to add to it. But it's a book about those who have given their lives for the sake of Christ. And if you want to put some things in perspective, you'd read the first few chapters of this book. I'm gripped by it. I'm gripped by the stories of people. Some of them didn't even have Bibles or scriptures. They didn't have worship services. They didn't have worship music on YouTube they could listen to 24-7. They were so gripped by their love for Jesus that some of them literally jumped into the fire instead of bowed to the idols. There was such a fierceness in their courage and love. God, I miss that completely. I love my life too much. I want to be counted with those in the great cloud of witnesses that did not love their life so much that they were afraid to die. We have to live our life for an eternal kingdom. Eternity was more significant to those three Hebrew boys than their temporal existence. They learned, they learned that there was something greater. There was something greater than that momentary pain and torture. Hebrews 10, 35 through 38 says, do not throw away this confident trust in the Lord. Remember the great reward it will bring you. Patient endurance is what you need now so that you will continue to do God's will. Then you will receive all that he has promised. For in just a little while, the coming one will come and not delay. And my righteous ones will live by faith. Listen to the words of Jesus though. I will take no pleasure in anyone who turns away. This is a hard word. But friends, there are too many of us that are living for this world and we're making excuses for bowing to idols and turning away. Jesus' words are he doesn't take pleasure in that. Jesus said, if you acknowledge me before men, I'll acknowledge you before the Father. If you deny me, however, I will deny you. And I think some of us have this real cookie cutter example of one day maybe we'll be before a king and he'll say, do you deny Jesus? And we'll say, no, I don't. And then we're good to go. But until then, we're okay. But every day we're given choices of what we're going to bow to. And when you bow to anything but the one true king, you're denying him. And his strong words are that he will turn away. I don't know how we cope with that. And I don't even have space for that in me. Jesus, you would turn away from me. But he says it. He will. If I continue to bow to the things that he died for, if I continue to bow to the things that are killing this culture that he's trying to rescue. Oh, God, forgive us. Oh, God, forgive us. He says, I will take no pleasure in anyone who turns away. But we are not like those who turn away. We are going to be the faithful ones whose souls will be saved. 
Guys, there's a judgment for those who turn away. We don't like to live in that reality because it seems too harsh. But the characters of the Bible, the heroes of the Bible, the people written about in this book, they had a real understanding of what the Bible calls the second death. It's the final judgment. And any momentary hardship, any momentary persecution, death and torture, which I honestly couldn't even relate to you in this manner because I don't know who's watching and what you can handle, but some of what people endured. And then what's crazy is the grace with which they endured it produced their soldiers and their torturers a conviction where the, the torturers would say, surely your God is real. And then they themselves were beheaded and killed for even saying so. That's our heritage. Let's not let them down. They're up here cheering us on. Let's not get caught up in this temporal stuff that we get caught up in. They understood the finality of the second death. And they did not fear. They did not fear the second death because they were committed that they were not going to bow. They were not going to bow to the idols of the land. We need a reality of heaven too. We need a firm gra grasp on judgment and that it's real. And then we need a firm grip on heaven and that it's real. Yes. It's so much more real than the chair you're sitting in, the room you're in, the people around you. It's more real than that. And I think we've bought into these false ideas and, and cheap versions that it means we're all going to sit in a room for thousands of years and sing the same song over and over and start to look the same and sound the same and, and it won't be interesting. Whoever, who wants to do that? Nothing, God doesn't even want to do that. If he did, that's what he would have created in Eden, but he didn't. He created days and nights, and he created things for people to steward and govern and grow, and, and, and the, the endless uh, work that was available to Adam and Eve, but it didn't have a curse to it. That's the heaven we're heading towards, where Jesus says in Revelation 21, it's all new now. I've come and taken what I intended and made it all new and fresh. It's a new heaven. It's a new earth. It's new skies. Everything's made new and fresh, and God dwells with us there. Just like in Eden, it's a restoration of what it was meant to be. Beauty restored. Purpose without pain. Work without curse. No sin. No sadness. Revelation 21 talks about how the nations will bring their glory and their honor. So even the beauty of cultures will be brought into this kingdom and will celebrate what God has done in each other with this diversity. And the artists will paint and sculpt. There'll be no limitations. Explorers will adventure. Scientists will discover. Historians will research and interview all the people they've always been fascinated with friendships that never end and Jesus and Jesus the king that we have chosen to serve the king that some of us will suffer for the king who will rule and reign for all eternity and he's inviting us to rule and reign with him he will be there it's what all of history is moving towards since the beginning of time. And it's why the spirit and the bride say, come. Because that's what I want to be a part of. And no momentary suffering will matter compared to that. It's how, it's how our, it's how our uh, heroes, it's how they overcame Hebrews 11.33 said that some were tortured, refusing to turn from God in order to be set free. They placed their hope in a better life after the resurrection. It's what we sang about this morning. No grave will hold me. The grave doesn't have power. Send me to the grave. Send me to the fiery furnace. 
It doesn't have power over me because I have a resurrected life coming on the other side. Some were jeered at, verse 36, and their backs cut open with whips. Guys, we have no idea. And you know there's Christians today that are enduring this in this world. This isn't just historical. This is now. Some of us need to wake up. The church needs to wake up in America to what it really means to serve Jesus. Some died by stoning. Some were sawed in half. Others were killed with swords. Some went about wearing skins of sheep and goats, destitute and oppressed and mistreated. They were too good for this world. Hebrews 13, verse 14 and 15 says, this world is not our permanent home. We are looking forward to one yet to come. Are you looking forward to it? If you are honest with yourself, And I've had these moments after the last few weeks. Am I looking forward to heaven enough that I would refuse to bow in the face of the dragon and start to ask God to work in your heart? Repent. Repent for the love of life that keeps us afraid to die. We are looking forward to a home yet to come. Therefore, Let us offer through Jesus a continual sacrifice of praise to God, proclaiming our allegiance to his name. So I'm going to close with this. Just like in Daniel 3, we serve a God who reveals himself as healer, deliverer, salvation, power, hope. He restores, he brings beauty from ashes. Like, we, like the song, you know, he takes graves and turns them into gardens. This is the God we serve. But even if he doesn't do that in every part of my life, even if I don't see the garden until after the grave, I'm committed that even if he doesn't rescue me from the fire, I won't bow because I know that even in the fire, he's there. Even in the fire, he's there. And history is full of stories of those like you and me who died, struggled, and were weak because of the purposes of God and their commitment to the kingdom of God. It doesn't always look like rah, rah, overcomer on this side, but it is an overcoming victory on the other side, and that's where we're headed. God does not always rescue or save us from hardships and suffering. And I think this is an important message for two reasons. One, God wants us to reevaluate and take down every idol. Because if we have idols in our lives, subtle or not, then we will not be strong enough to stand till the end. But secondly, I want to encourage those of you that in this season, you may be wondering, where is Jesus? This isn't turning out like I thought it would. If you've lost a job, if you're facing hardship, maybe you've even lost family members. This whole season has been very difficult for you. I want you to understand something. Sometimes Jesus doesn't show up like you expect him to. You know, there's an example in, um, I think it's in Luke, I can't remember what chapter, where John the Baptist is in prison for confronting Herod. And he's in prison and uh, he sends his disciples to Jesus. And here he is. He was so passionate about the kingdom of God coming. He's announcing, repent, repent. The kingdom of God is here. And then now he's sitting in prison. And he sends his disciples to Jesus. And he says, are you who you say you are? Are you really the son of God? And I think I hear in his heart cry, how come I'm sitting in prison? Guys, God doesn't always show up like we we think he's going to show up. But Jesus' response was, blessed are those 
who will not fall away on account of me. When I don't, when Jesus doesn't show up, he says, when I don't show up like you think I'm going to, you're blessed if you won't fall away. You're blessed if you refuse to bow, even if, because you trust Jesus and you're living for eternity. Blessed are those who will not fall away on account of me. Guys, refusing to bow to the idols of our, cult, of our culture, fixing our eyes on Jesus, and living for an eternal kingdom will be our overcoming power and strength. Yes. History is moving towards one unchangeable goal. The everlasting kingdom of God. Satan may be advancing. It may seem like this world is spiraling out of control. The dragon might be roaring and pouncing, but I'm telling you his time is short. Yeah. And we are part of a bigger story. Yeah. It's a rescue mission led by our, our King Jesus. He's coming to make all things new. So don't be discouraged and don't be afraid. Your suffering, your sacrifice, your obedience will advance the kingdom of God. And no matter what tomorrow holds, we will not bow. We will fix our eyes on Jesus. We will live for an eternal kingdom. And we will say with those Hebrews, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, O oh Satan. But even if he doesn't in this lifetime, we want to make it very clear to you. We will never serve your gods and we will never worship the gold statue that you have set up. So I want to ask you today, where are you in this kingdom story? Where are your idols? What are you bowing to? What are you bowing to hoping that God understands because of the pressure you're under? Because if you don't bow, if you don't, if you don't participate in this work party, you might not get the promotion. If you don't go here and do this, you might not be accepted in this crowd. If you don't watch this show, you won't know what to talk about at the next gathering you participate in. It's these dumb little things. They're so dumb in the grand scheme. And yet we bow to them day after day after day. Holy Spirit, what are these idols I'm bowing to? What are these idols I'm bowing to? Guys, every idol must come down. Jesus, every idol must come down. We kick down every idol. We crush every idol. We step on it. We defy it. Is your focus misplaced right now? You're having a hard time saying no to the idols because you haven't, your eyes aren't fixed on Jesus. Your yes isn't fixed on Jesus. Don't walk away from this moment without repenting, without inviting Jesus back in to every area where he has your strongest yes. And are you living your life as if this is the only thing that matters? Is your love of life keeping you from yearning for an eternal kingdom? Does your heart cry, come Lord Jesus, come. If we don't deal with this stuff, we're not gonna overcome. We're way off track. Jesus help. This is a unique time in history of resetting, refocusing, reevaluating the priorities of our life. Get in on the rescue mission of Jesus. It's the only way to be an overcoming Christian in this world. You want to make a difference, you want to be an influence, live according to the kingdom of God. It's why we are praying for revival because if we're burning for him and he burns in us, then our world will be changed. This kingdom will be advanced, but we have to do it his way. Are you ready? 
Are you prepared to stand against the Nebuchadnezzars of this land, refusing to bow, even if it means losing your life? Give your whole life to Jesus. Give your whole life to Jesus. Serve him with all you are. Recommit. Some of you need to bow to him right now where you are. You need to get on your knees and remind yourself who your allegiance is to. Jesus, burn in me until I burn for you. Those three Hebrew boys, they burned for God before they were ever put in that fiery furnace. Jesus, with the fire, would your fire consume me so that no earthly punishment, no fire of suffering will cause me to lose sight of who you are. Burn in me until I burn for you, Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.